It was the 11th of August. I tried to gather my words. 2021. I looked around and then at Mr. Stark. He was quickly noting everything in his small diary. Then I took a deep breath and started again. When Roger and Kelly came to me and informed me about their plans, I picked up the glass from the table beside me and took a sip. Although, the moment Roger told me that Kelly and him had something to discuss with me, my instincts warned me it might be some Ghostbuster adventure. I stopped for a moment, then continued. Kelly and Roger are always like this, always looking for some adventure, trying to capture some creepy activity on their cameras, and I, I'm just a music student who likes to sing holy songs. I always end up going with them for their little adventures. What did your friends do? Mr. Stark asked. Well, Roger worked at a camera installation company. He wrote this down as I told him. This knowledge makes it even easier for him to get into these things and search for answers. I grinned, looking down at my hands. And Kelly... I stopped. <sighs> she helps her father in maintaining his workshop. That's why whenever we plan any trips, she finds it difficult to join, but she comes anyway. I stood up from my place and went to the window and stared into the bewilderment of the darkness before continuing. I tried to resist for a while, like I always do. I turned around and looked out again. And then I surrendered, like I always do. I chuckled. I am their best friend, I smile. They're smart, always finding a way of convincing me. And since I am their best friend, I never let them down either, I replied, placing my hand on the window. Well, we decided our departure for the morning of August 13th, and decided to investigate that same night. I turned around and looked at Mr. Stark. It was a Friday night, you know, the most cliche, Friday the 13th. Roger was the one who always did the searching, always looking on the internet, finding something exciting, he used to say. I stopped and took a breath. He told us about Velisca and about the house there where eight people were found murdered by an axe. I went back to my chair but stood beside it. He informed us about everything and also told us the details about the murder and how it wasn't resolved and that he had this eerie feeling that... This has something to do with something else, something paranormal, I said. He thought maybe this was the reason the murder mystery was never resolved, because someone more than human was involved. As we were all busy that week and had a very tough schedule planned for the week coming ahead, we decided to make it short, only for a night, and wrap everything up in the morning. I stopped for a while again before continuing. Roger's a technician who knows everything about camera installation and maintenance, so he never needed anyone for any kind of help. I sat down on the chair and drank some more water, talking so continuously was making my throat dry. Roger had a customized van equipped with all this high-end equipment for his lone hunting trips. We asked the owner and he allowed us to set up our equipment around the property as long as we don't damage the interior of the hotel. I stopped and looked at Mr. Stark. He was constantly writing. As everything was ready and all set, we departed on August 13th. I stopped one more time and then continued. I am Andy Hastings, a 22-year-old music student, and what I'm about to tell you is all reality, witnessed by my own eyes. I took a deep breath, which I believe I will never forget for the rest of my life. Everything seemed really beautiful. The way we took to reach the destination was really breathtaking. We three were really enjoying the way Kelly fell in love with the scenery. Roger was teasing Kelly and me on our way and we were also teasing him back. It took us around four to five hours to reach that place. It seemed like we had just entered a forest or something. Roger told us that this forest used to be the fields belonging to the Charles family 
and after their house was abandoned, the area was surrounded by wild trees and plants. As we entered the pathway of the house, we all felt something strange. The sound of the strange birds and the frightening branches of the trees were making the view even more terrifying. When we reached the Charles property, it was still daytime, but everything seemed dusky inside the house, and it was really dark, even when the sun was still present. We got there earlier because we had to set all the cameras inside the house. We needed to capture everything. We had asked Roger earlier about the incidents inside the house, so he told us that many years back, there had been heinous murders. Not one or two, but eight people had been found dead there. He informed us that after the incident, all the members of the family had died, so some other family member had inherited the house. He tried his best to sell the property. In the initial years after, he tried to maintain everything, the fields, the garden, and everything else inside the house, but many rumors about the house started to break out, so he couldn't sell it. But Roger told us that he had this gut feeling that all those rumors may not just be rumors, but true stories and the murder of the Charles family was also because of some mystical beings. I could not disagree with them as the house was giving very eerie vibes. I myself was feeling very negative energy from the property. As soon as we entered the premises, every one of us had felt very strange, like we were being watched by something. Roger set up seven cameras around the outside of the property and on the first floor as Kelly and I made the ground floor our home base. It also had a little basement. First we tried to install one of our cameras there, but either it would keep on falling, which with some difficulty we tried to fix it anyway, but then when we checked the screen in our van to verify all the cameras had been placed properly, we couldn't see anything on it. So we decided to take that camera off and instead investigate the area with our portable camera. The basement was the most terrifying looking place in this whole house. Although the current owner renovated the house very frequently, the basement seemed like it had been left abandoned for a century or two. Now, whenever I think about it, I imagine that all this creepiness of the area and the camera not setting up might be a clue for us to leave the place, but we were so stubborn, we decided to investigate anyway. We had brought so much equipment with us, all kinds of gadgets for different purposes. I'm sure if we would have asked Roger about these things, he would have given us a reason for everything. After getting everything ready, we decided to start our work after sunset. Although the house was already quite dark, we still waited anyway. Roger believed that these paranormal creatures became more active during the nighttime rather than day. He asked us if everything was ready before starting our little adventure. He was carrying a handy cam in his hand and had attached a flashlight to his cap. We were both doing the same. Kelly was holding an EMF detector to check any change in frequency. According to Roger, whenever a ghost is around, the frequency changes and the EMF catches the change in frequency. I was holding a thermal sensor video camera because he believed that the ghost was a very low temperature, so if they're all around us, we would feel cold as well and this would pick it up. We replied with affirmation. It was the first time I was feeling like wanting to go back home. I honestly didn't want to go any farther, but I kept it to myself and didn't want to show any sign of weakness. And I could see that Kelly's face had the same reactions as mine. Roger turned his handycam on and turned it to himself. We were behind him when he started the recording. He always used to do this at the start of the hunt, pretending to be one of those shows where people explore these kinds of things. We asked him several times why he does this and he always gave us the same answer, that several years from now when he sees these recordings, he'll enjoy every bit of it. It'll be just like one of those TV shows. I remember he first introduced himself then me and Kelly, and then he talked a little about the place, its vicinity and the tragedy attached to it. I remember him asking us where to start. I could easily see it on Kelly's face that she'd rather leave the premises than continue, so I suggested starting from the upper portion, and we all went upstairs. 
So we all started our little quest from the top area. It wasn't a very big house, so the upper portion had three rooms in total with a little lobby where the stairs were made. Nothing fell out of the ordinary for a while. We tried to talk to whatever was there, ask them to make a sound or something, but nothing happened. We tried everything, but all in vain. After some time, Kelly was getting bored of everything, so we started messing around, like saying stupid things and making fun of these entities. I still don't understand what had happened to Kelly, although she was very scared. But after a while, she went a little further with the messing around part, and maybe they didn't like the way we were talking about them. I am sick of all this. I remember her telling me. She yelled at the walls, asking them where they were and to reveal themselves. I even remember her yelling if they were too scared to do something. What are you doing? I remember asking her as my heart was racing really fast, as if something bad was going to happen. My gut feeling was constantly telling me that this was not going in the right way. Even Roger was feeling annoyed at her yelling at the walls and asked her to stop doing it. Then, I suddenly started feeling strange, and I remember them telling me that I didn't feel good there, and that I felt like I was very cold there. I remember feeling chills running down my spine, but Kelly was still not becoming serious and told us that she felt absolutely nothing. I agree with Andy, Roger had replied, but he wasn't scared, rather his voice was filled with excitement. There's something strange going on here. I remember he had said this with shining eyes as if he had discovered a gold mine, and he quickly took the camera and started recording. We asked them if they could hear us, and if they were, to just give us a sign or something. We were moving around carefully, looking everywhere for anything. Hello? Suddenly I heard Kelly shout. Is someone there? She was asking. Roger turned around quickly and went towards her and asked what she had seen. Kelly stopped and pointed with her flashlight towards one of the rooms in the lobby and told us that she had seen someone in there. But I hadn't seen anything, so I pointed my flashlight at the same spot and told them to go and look inside the room to see if we could record something. This is gonna be fun, Roger said excitedly. All three of us moved forward carefully and entered the room which Kelly had pointed out. When we went inside, it was empty, but I could feel that something was going on there. There's no one, Roger said with disappointment. He asked me to check the EMF detector. Nothing, I told him, and asked Kelly what she had seen earlier. She told us she had seen a little boy around three or four years old. She then looked around with the beam of her light and added it was a shadow. She further explained that it was not like an actual person, but a shadow of that person. Suddenly, we heard a loud blood-curdling scream come out of the other room. All three of us jumped around, flashing our lights at the door. I remember asking them what it was, but of course they had no answer. I think it was coming from the room across from this one, Roger said. Then he looked at the camera and recording himself, saying, You all must have heard the scream, and we're going to go check that room now. He pointed the camera towards the door and started to move forward. Kelly and I were following. My feet felt so heavy, like they were converted into concrete blocks. I imagined if Kelly and Roger were feeling the same. We came out of the room. Nothing felt out of the ordinary. Everything was just like the way it was before. Look! I can still hear Kelly's terrified voice in my head. We both turned around to see that she was still inside the room, but she was not looking at us. She was looking around her. Roger asked what she had seen. What she said was very confusing in the beginning, but we then understood. She told us that she had seen herself. She pointed at a corner across the room. There was indeed a person standing there, dressed just like Kelly but facing the wall, so we could not look upon the face. Who's there? I remember asking while trying to act courageously. It didn't move. I looked at Roger and Kelly. We're just trying to communicate with you. We don't want to harm you, Kelly said while moving towards the figure. All of a sudden, the figure turned around. It was the most horrific thing I had ever seen. 
It had no eyes and nose, just big, large teeth on her entire face covered in blood. We all screamed and ran out of the room. I turned around to see if it was following, but there was nothing. Whatever it was, it was not there anymore. Guys, it's gone, I told them. We all stopped to catch our breath. We just ran from one room to another, but it felt as if we ran a marathon. We were standing there in the other room when suddenly we heard a loud giggle from exactly outside of the room we were standing in. What was that? Roger said and turned around immediately and asked us if we had heard it or not. We both nodded as we were too terrified to say anything. It could be seen on our faces. Roger made to check out what had made the sound and left the room. We both followed behind. As we came out of the room, it was empty, like before. Suddenly, we heard a loud bang, and we turned around to see the entire furniture of the room we had just left torn apart. Whoa! was all I managed to say. We again entered the room and moved our flashlights around. The room had a window, but it was sealed from the outside, so there was no wind getting inside. And of course, this couldn't have been caused by just wind. The two of them went further inside of the room and stood near the corner. They had just reached it when the door behind them banged loudly. What was that? Kelly asked us both, but we didn't say anything. The three of us walked out of the room and looked around. There was something written on the walls. We first thought it was some alien language, but when we focused on the writing, it was written in English. You asked for it. I still remember the writings, and then I flashed on another wall. There was written, You started it. We will end it. I turned around to look at Kelly and Roger, and saw sweat running down Roger's face. It was the first time I had ever seen him terrified. Suddenly, Roger looked at me and Kelly and asked us if we had said anything. We were both just clueless and looked at each other with confused expressions. Then he told us that he had just heard a girl's voice, as if someone had just said something to him, straight into his ear. I quickly whipped my flashlight around the corner. I saw someone sitting in a rocking chair, but it was more a shadow than a person. I quietly informed them about the presence, but they both were already looking at it. Suddenly the shadow stood up and started to come near us. The three of us intentionally started moving backwards as it came towards us, and then with a loud wail the shadow vanished into thin air. Kelly said out loud with a stern tone that she had seen enough and didn't want any further investigations, but Roger wasn't ready to leave this early and asked her to stay just a little longer. But I also didn't want to continue and asked him to leave just like Kelly did. He wanted to pack everything but we were too terrified to do so and suggested that we'll do it later in the morning. He agreed and the three of us started to descend the staircase. We reached the ground floor and towards the main entrance but couldn't see the door and wondered where it was. The door's not here! I remember Roger telling us with a petrified expression and I felt something sinking inside of me. Kelly could not understand and was insisting that we must have come the wrong way, but the truth was that there was no escape for us anymore. She was violently searching for the door, placing her hand on the wall, searching everywhere. You started it. We will end it. I remember the writings on the wall, and it made us all realize that those entities were not letting us go. There must be a way out! Kelly started pacing to and fro, saying, The back door! There must be a back door behind the kitchen! She said with joy. It also lit up our faces with hope, and we all carefully started to go to the back. The house had a living room, master bedroom, and kitchen on the ground floor. We were walking past the living room when we heard someone playing a piano inside the room. We all stopped and flashed our lights inside. And as we did so, the music stopped. Kelly walked inside the living room. What are you doing? Roger asked her, but she wasn't listening. He asked her to stop, but she didn't. She kept on moving inside and stood in front of the piano and started playing it. She was playing it beautifully. Where she learned to play it, I have no idea. Roger called out her name and ran towards her, grabbing her hand, and as he did, he tried to pull her back, but she didn't budge. What's wrong with you? Roger shouted with annoyance. 
She looked up at us. We both screamed loudly. Her face was disappearing. One eye was gone, and then the other, her nose, her lips, and then there was absolutely nothing on her face. Roger quickly ran out of the room, and we both ran towards the kitchen to find the back door. But there was no door, no windows, just walls all around us. We are trapped. We're trapped. We can't leave the house, and we've lost Kelly as well, I said, sobbing. Roger was trying to stay composed and asked me not to lose hope and started thinking. I angrily asked him if he had a plan and he said he doesn't know. He continued trying to recompose himself and said he couldn't think of anything but he needed me and that we had to work together. It was the only hope for us. I wiped my tears off and nodded. He was right. We had to work together to find a way out. We sat down there on the floor. I didn't want to go outside the kitchen again. I could still hear the piano music in my head. Roger didn't want to also, but sitting here would get us nowhere. Suddenly we heard loud bangs from above, as if someone was moving, and the bangs were heading towards the staircase. We have to hide before this creature reaches us, I remember him telling me, and heading again where the door should be. I didn't say anything, but quietly followed him. We came out of the kitchen and saw the master bedroom right beside us. I could still hear the bangs on the stairway. Every bang was making my heart beat faster. We quickly entered the room and saw a cupboard there. We opened the door and hid behind it. The thumping sound was so loud that it felt like it was going to blow down the whole house. We both were as silent as death. Neither of us was about to say anything. The sound was coming nearer and nearer, and then right outside of the room we were hiding in. I did not know what Roger was thinking, but I was feeling death coming nearer. I silently prayed to God for our safety and looked at Roger. He had placed his hand over his mouth in order to stop himself from screaming from whatever was going to enter. I did the same because getting caught by a frightening figure was the last thing I would have wanted. Suddenly, I heard the door creaking open. We were silently looking from inside. I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see what was coming. Roger quietly gasped beside me, and his gasping made me open my eyes, and I saw what I know I will regret seeing for the rest of my whole life. A dark shadow was entering the room. In its shadowy hand was something that seemed like a skinned animal at first. He slammed the animal hard on the floor, which made the thumping sound, and blood oozed out of the part where there was supposed to be a head. No, Roger silently said. I could not understand what made him gasp like this. And then, I saw it, and I could hardly stop myself from screaming. Behind him had come another shadowy figure holding the head. Some human head. Blood was dripping down her neck, and then I again watched the skinned animal. It was no animal, but a human body. It must belong to the person whose head the other shadow was holding. My head started to spin. I could not think clearly. I was about to fall, but Roger held me at the right moment and looked at me, and mouth, no. I nodded, and that was all I could have done. I didn't want to, but I managed to take a peek, and I saw another shadowy figure holding an axe. I don't think that the murders that had happened here were simply murders. There was some other entity that was also involved. I remember Roger telling us about his opinion, and right then, I was fully in agreement with what I had seen. The shadowy creature again slammed that body on the floor which made my heart go wild, and I tightened my grip on my mouth in order to stop myself from screaming. After some time which seemed like ages. The creatures left the room, leaving the body and the head behind. I could see the horror in the eyes of the head and I stopped myself from watching that horrible sight. I was unable to move from my place and get out of there. Roger was also not moving. We again heard banging noises like someone was destroying everything. Then we heard the basement door opening and closing. We can't hide anymore, I whispered in his ear. I still remember the look on his face. There were no expressions at all. What are you thinking? What do you suggest? I asked him again. 
I'm not thinking about anything, Roger finally said. But we can't hide here any longer. I looked at the body once again and shivered. We have no option. You've already seen every escape route has vanished. No door, no window. He felt defeated, but I wasn't ready to give up. What about the basement? I suggested. There must be a door down there. Do you hear yourself? I remember him saying in disbelief. Those shadows have gone down there and I really don't want to go after any shadows. I tried to think of something. I really wanted to get out of there. I took out my phone, but it had no signal. Then out of agony, I tried to push the wall and it did budge a little. I looked excitedly at Roger and he was looking also at me and we carefully pushed it harder and harder, trying not to make any noise. After a while, it slid open. I saw a small window behind it and saw our van parked outside, but the window was so small there was no way we could slide through it, so we decided not to break it. I saw that there were some small steps grooved in the wall to climb up and down. I looked down and there was a small passageway leading into the basement, and I could see a door on the adjacent side of the wall. I shook him and told him to start climbing. He hesitated a little bit as the alley was leading us to the basement, but the sight of our van and the door gave us courage. He crept into the tiny alley and started to climb down the stairs. I followed behind him. It was not a very long climb, but every second seemed like a million years, and with every step my heart started to beat faster. As we stepped down onto the floor, we carefully looked around. We were at the far end of the basement, away from the door leading towards the upper portion. We were still holding the flashlights in our hands, but the beams were very low. We crept towards the exit door, but to our horror, it was locked. We have to find a way to open it up. I whispered to Roger. I was thinking about it when I realized that Kelly once taught me how to open a lock with a pin. Thinking about her made my eyes water, but I wiped them away. I had to keep my head present. Do you hear that? Roger suddenly whispered in my ears. Hear what? I asked, terrified. Someone's here, he silently said. As I tried to listen to it, I realized that there was a sound coming from somewhere, as if someone was trying to shout out. Quick, my mind told me. Who is that? I asked him, scared. I realized it was coming from a box at a distance. Carefully, I walked towards it, and when I reached nearer, I realized it was Kelly. Kelly! I called out, not realizing that I was not supposed to speak loudly. Upon hearing her name, she asked loudly for help. I tried to look for something, anything, to open it, and found an axe. I picked it up and started to break it. And after a few minutes, Kelly came out of the box, and we hugged. What happened? We saw you! Roger could not complete his sentence, as he was looking at something. I followed his gaze, and to my horror, I saw a large, dark shadow appearing right in front of us. It grabbed Kelly by her leg, dragging her into another room, slamming the door behind her. I started shouting as it happened so quickly. Roger yelled for me to quickly open the exit door as he had guns inside the van. I nodded and searched my pockets where I found a pin to pick the lock. Finally, the lock clicked open and Roger went outside. He came back running into the house with his AR-15 and handed me his pistol. We kicked the door open and saw Kelly fighting off a large wolf. Roger grabbed Kelly by the arm and the three of us ran. I saw an elevator shaft on my right. I shouted at them to follow me. I ran towards it with Kelly and Roger trailing behind me. The large werewolf was also following behind. We ran past the shaft and returned fire at the large wolf man, knocking him into the old elevator shaft. After we ran for the exit, to our horror, we were surrounded by large shadowy figures. We cannot give up! I shouted, and we all ran towards the van and sat inside. Roger quickly revved up the engine and put the van into reverse and kept driving until we hit the road, and we never looked back. Wow, that was some adventure, Mr. Stark said. Yeah, I replied. Do you still go on these adventures? He asked. Sure we do, I smiled. We just keep our guns handy.